This video is going to have my career over before it even started. I'd like to state this video is not me just talking about some crappy games that wasted my time. No, 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 no. This is a video that contains some highly regarded games that very well could be your favorites, and I'm going to trash on them. After this video goes live, I will no longer be Captain SNES, but Captain, hey, remember that guy that we threw overboard months ago because his opinion was factually wrong and had no basis in the source material he was talking about? SNES? So for the sake of not getting all the hate comments when the video first starts, I'll be talking about the games in order of their Metacritic score, from lowest to highest, and at the very end I have one game, while it's not a Switch exclusive, does have a Switch port and has haunted me since the day I've bought it. Starting this video out strong, the first game on my list has to go to 1-2 Switch. I know this is the game that everybody points to when they talk about bad Switch games, but I can assure you it's for a reason. This game embodies a lot of the problems that I think we've seen with the Switch throughout its life cycle with uh, some of the art style we see in the game, how it's kind of corporate, kind of forced, kind of also lacks identity besides just being really weird and cringy. If you don't know what 1-2 Switch is, let me have the pleasure of introducing it to you. 1-2 Switch is a minigame collection that was released as a launch title for the Switch on March 3rd, 2017. The game was there to show off the cool features of the system. It was like a tech demo for HD rumble, gyro, the IR camera. But it was also a strictly head-to-head -head competition game for you and one other friend. Now, to give the game some credit, in some ways it was unlike anything I had ever experienced before because while you could look at the screen and some of the games were on the screen, most of the time it had you looking at the other player that you were playing with and the screen was just kind of like a secondary option. Of course this is the same 1-2 Switch that had the ball counting game that everybody talks about where you move the controller around and try to guess how many balls are in it. Really cool tech demo, not much more than that. Some of the other standouts were the showdown game where you're a cowboy and you face off against your opponent like in an old school showdown. It also had the game where you point the IR camera at your mouth and try to eat the most sandwiches out of anybody. Uh, that one was definitely entertaining. And the one that I found particularly cool was the table tennis game. It was like playing invisible table tennis and it was all based on sound rather than looking at a table tennis match, but it was uh, it was pretty cool. Overall, it, it did have some pretty fun mini games, but the problem comes into play when you realize that there are only like five fun games in this collection that last less than a minute each with no alternative modes, and you're left with a $50 cringy paperweight that makes you look like an ass for even trying to show it off in the first place. Not to mention the whole game looks like if you took that corporate art style and made people live in it. It all comes off as very cringy, corporate, and forced. For me, and I believe what happened to many other people out there, the reason that we even picked this game up in the first place was out of desperation after beating Breath of the Wild and having nothing else to do with our Switches. This next game kind of follows that same pattern. Number 2, Kirby Star Allies. Like I said, this game follows in the footsteps of 1-2 Switch with buying it out of desperation, as by this point in the Switch's life cycle, Mario Odyssey had been out for a few months at this point and everybody had already beaten it. If you don't know what Kirby Star Allies is, this is a 2D Kirby game like all the rest, except the main gimmick of this one was being able to turn your power-ups into NPCs that would fight alongside you. So you know what that means. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Besides the ally gimmick, it's a run-of-the-mill Kirby game, but what makes it bad in my book is the lack of any charm and that it was way too easy to beat. I beat the whole game within days of it coming out and I don't think I died a single time during it. I don't know if Kirby was just this easy and I didn't know it due to having missed out on all the 3DS Kirby games, but if Forgotten Land has showed me anything, it's that you can have a Kirby game that's easy and still is an enjoyable experience. Before playing this game, I had never experienced a game so easy and forgettable. I remember beating it and immediately looking at how much GameStop would give me for it and thinking that was my best option to just get it out of my collection. Thankfully nowadays we have better Kirby games, but back then I was trying to accept the fact that maybe my Kirby days were over and I'd never enjoy one again. Number three, this is where we start getting into some rough territory. You guys might not like me after this one, definitely not after number four, but number three is Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I was pretty damn excited to get my hands on this game. I had always heard how legendary the first game was and couldn't pass up on this one. 
I booted up the game for the first time, and after some dialogue, a good amount, a lot, a lot of dialogue, a lot of slow-ass dialogue, I was finally exploring the open landscapes and getting my hands dirty with all things Xenoblade. Now this is finally when the game gets good, I thought. Except the game never got to that point of being really good for me. So I took to the internet. I wanted to see if other people were having a good time with the game, if there was anything I was doing wrong while I was playing the game, if I just wasn't getting some mechanic or just something that made it way better. But what I found online was a treasure trove of people dogging on this game. Now granted, this was six years ago. I don't remember everything about my experience with this game, but what I do remember is everyone saying it took about 30 to 40 hours for the game to get good. So being that the game was very new, no reviewers had really gotten all that far through it, so I decided to, you know, take the comments and play 30 to 40 hours of the game. I forced myself to play this game for hours on end because I wanted so badly to like this. I was constantly checking my playtime to see how many hours I had left until things finally got good. But to my dismay, they never did. That's certainly the last time that I'm going to waste this much time because somebody told me, oh, you just have to wait until the game gets good. No, never again. I wasted far too much of my time with this game and it sucks because this was the first RPG outside of Pokemon I really tried to get invested into. And to this day, I blame it for me not liking RPGs. But somehow, someway, with all the hate this game got, it has an 83 on Metacritic. Like, I only remember people absolutely dogging on this game, but come to find out, some people actually enjoy it. I can't explain that, but whatever. On to number four. I was really hyped for this game. I was the only one of my friends excited for this when it got announced at E3 2018, but I've got to say it. What did they do to Fire Emblem? I thought this was a turn-based tactics game about fighting with my troops, guerrilla warfare style, through open landscapes. Not a teacher role-playing game where 90% of my time is teaching little Tommy what Vietnam is and having questionably close relationships with my students. I really don't have much to say on this game. I was introduced to the series through Birthright and had a good amount of fun with it, but Teacher Simulator being my first new Fire Emblem game did not sit well with me. I swear, the game, from what I can remember, was 80% finding stupid objectives to do in between battle, and being stressed the hell out that if I didn't do everything in time, I'd be absolutely screwed for the next battle. I don't see myself returning to the franchise anytime soon. I think I'll just have to find another turn-based tactics game to fill that void. Is Mario and Rabbids any good? Alright, before this last one, I'd appreciate it if you guys would like and subscribe if you've enjoyed the video. Uh, share it around to some of your friends. Do whatever you will. Definitely leave me comments below on what you think. I, I'm ready to take the heat on this one. But this last game. This last game is one that I hope none of you have ever heard of before. It's on this list only because of how much I regret it and because there's a Switch port of the game. It's a game that I only bought because I had heard some small YouTuber hype it up in a video he was making about the game. So the story goes, I was at a local game store trading in some Pokemon cards, and looking through the game case at the Game Boy Advance games, of all things, I saw the game that this YouTuber was talking about. James Pond, codename Robocod. It was like $5, so I got it. I more or less got it just because I had recognized the game and because the name of it was just so stupid, but nonetheless I was excited to go home and see what it was all about. When I got home I popped this in my Game Boy and oh boy was I in for a treat. This game was a fever dream. I played as a fish with infinitely extendable legs and every level was made by describing your friend's acid trip. But there are food items scattered everywhere, and just when you think that that's the whole game, you get jump scared by sentient cars that want to kill you. Look at this thing. What is that? The whole game looks like nightmare fuel for a six-year-old. Can, can you even tell what you're looking at here? I can't, and for some reason it hurts. But leaving all the acid trip visuals aside, the thing that really gets me about this game is what I found out while trying to research it. This is the second game in the James Pond franchise. It was released in 1991, 
And the number of platforms this game has released on is mind-blowing. Including, but probably not limited to, the Amiga, the Amiga AGA, the Amiga CD32, I don't know half these existed, the Atari ST, the Sega Genesis, the Commodore 64, the Acorn Archimedes, MS-DOS, Game Gear, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, PlayStation, Master System, SNES, oh we're not done, Nintendo DS, PlayStation 2, and lastly, the Switch. What the hell is going on here? We have a game that was released in 1991 with no further iterations being ported to a modern console in 2019, almost 30 years after the original release date. I wish I could explain to you why this $5 Game Boy game would make me regret owning it so much, but for some reason whenever I think of this game, it just angers me that it still sits into my collection to this day. This video has definitely got me a bit heated, but uh, guys, give me, give me the heat in the comments. I'm waiting for it. Tell me that I'm wrong on every front. Tell me what you think of these games. I know that the Xenoblade and Fire Emblem crowds are probably going to have my head for this video. Uh, it's just because I'm not an RPG guy, I think, at the end of the day. But again, maybe that's Xenoblade's fault. But I want to hear it from you guys. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Have you even heard of James Pond? Otherwise, I hope all you guys and gals have enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, comment, favorite, and subscribe. This has been Captain SNES, signing out. Peace.